there and welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people, dealing with topical issues. And boy, a, a, economists have just become center stage in this country as scientists, as predictors, as people should, we should rely on for a lot of big decisions. Yeah, and as I have done for many years in my own practice, I relied heavily on economists. And uh, they are just a wonderful group of folks to talk with. They know a lot more than, than just economics and are able to apply it across the board in meaningful ways. We have uh, hit it out of the park uh, this week by having uh, Dr. Travis Roach, the head of the economics department at the University of Central Oklahoma, join us to talk about the supply chain problem in the world and in mm -hmm. the United States. And it trickles down into a lot of different areas that affect us and you, and we'll get to it today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. Right now, six feet can feel like a long ways away. But from six feet, we can still smile at each other. From our doorways and our stairways, from opposite sides of the street and opposite sides of the country, through fear and frustrations, we can remind each other that we are still here for each other because we can still smile at each other and we're not going anywhere. Military service ran in my blood, starting from my father, which joined the Navy, on the Chickasaw side, my uncle, which served in the United States Army. I'm Benjamin Espinosa, Chief Petty Officer, United States Navy, and I'm Chickasaw. I went to the Secretary of Defense's staff at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., which ultimately led to becoming a combat support technician for Naval Special Warfare, specifically SEAL Team 10. I think to be proud and to love your tribe, to love being Chickasaw, you also have to love being American. You also have to love everything that America stands for. Equality, perseverance, professionalism, and power. I want my family to know that their father is a good person, but also feels that he has an obligation to the country and to love this nation. Anything worth having is worth dying for. The military and the country owes me nothing. I owe it everything. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce today's guest. As we uh, talked about in the open, our guest today is Dr. Travis Roach, the uh, head of the economics department at the University of Central Oklahoma. I've known Travis for a while and worked with him in my own practice, and uh, he is a star. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, this year, uh, UCO elevated him to the head of the economics department. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at North Texas uh, University. Uh, he, did his, he got his Ph.D. at uh, Texas Tech University. Uh, he's been at UCO since 2015. Uh, he, uh, in 2021, just this year, became department chair. He's a prolific writer, a teacher, and lecturer, and uh, his bio will go on about five or six pages uh, on just the things that he has written. So he not only talks about stuff, he researches it and puts it on paper and puts his reputation on the line freely about uh, positions he has taken. Uh, he um, <clears throat> has uh, worked uh, with me personally, I should uh, disclose, as an outstanding expert witness in antitrust matters. And, but Travis, we're really glad to have you. Welcome to The Verdict. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. We had that quote going into this segment from Elon Musk that says, supply chains have gotten tricky. Why have they gotten tricky? That's a really great question. And I always tell my students that it, it's never a bad time to study economics, right? If, mm -hmm. if the economy is going well, we're asked, hey, how do we keep this going? If the economy is having a tough time, we're asked, hey, how do we fix this? So, you know, good and the bad, we're always there to offer some advice, hopefully. Um, but so why is it tricky is because it's, it's taking a million parts and trying to move them in concert with one another. Um, the best analogy I can think of is think of an orchestra. You have a conductor. They're, they're helping to move the horns and the clarinets and the cello all together to make one beautiful symphony, right? Now imagine this conductor walked away. 
with this experienced group of musicians, they can probably keep together, keep producing beautiful music, but imagine they walked away and the orchestra stopped and they had to all get started back up again together. So maybe you have the clarinetist join in and then maybe the horn goes, oh, I recognize this, I might try and jump in as well. And it would take a really long time to bring the symphony back up and playing as it ought to. And that's what we're seeing with supply chains right now is that mm -hmm. the log jam that was created by COVID-19 is taking months and years to unravel. Uh, I had a, a college classmate uh, back in the 1700s by the name of Thomas Reed. And Thomas Reed said something that's familiar to both of you, I'm sure, that a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Uh, where is the weak link in our supply chain now? Is there a single spot that you can say caused the slowdown in goods getting to uh, the folks who want to sell them and getting them up on the shelves? I don't know that there's a single weak link. I think maybe- Probably many. Yeah, many, and it, it's, if you're, you know, let's say stage three of a supply chain, you're trying to predict when stage two will be fired, but you can't see that happening, and so you're trying to jump in right at the exact right time. And, and there, we're having a hard time sharing information across industries. Um, and if you think about, you know, something as simple as the burger that might sit on your table, for that to happen, the cow needs to be taken to be slaughtered and to be produced, and it gets at the McDonald's, it ends at your table, but that cow had to be fed for its entire lifetime, and that normally occurs at a feedlot, and that involves a lot of corn, so that means the corn had to be grown years ago to be there for the cow to grow, to then be transported to be turned into a hamburger. And so these are three, four-year timelines that we're depending on, and so one single I'm not, a mistake is the wrong word, but one single shock to the system can have rippling effects over years. Well, we're also, though, we're relying on foreign manufacturing. Sure. And, and, and these are in countries that sometimes are unstable, or sometimes are, are, are political friends. And then you throw in, uh, you know, the COVID, and you have different restrictions, and, and all of a sudden, you know, what was normal is anything but normal. How much does the fact that we're relying on China and Vietnam and, and other countries to produce goods for the United States play into the supply chain issues? I think it matters a lot. Um, I saw today, American University puts out an auto index, and they, I think it's about half of a Dodge 1500 truck is produced elsewhere. So it might be finished here in the United States, but it's taking this coordination of parts across countries, across continents. And so you have some producers who are maybe thinking, well, to get ahead of this supply chain problem, I might move some of my production back onshore, maybe south to Mexico. Uh, but those are long-term decisions. That does nothing for us in the, in the immediate three to six months. And so still, this is, you, know, you might be reducing your risk in the future, but we're taking coordination, and, and it involves countries, and you're right, with ally ships, and then, again, different restrictions regarding COVID and who can enter and exit the country and what shipping vessels can enter and exit the country. And then they're also tied up with all the other companies who are trying to solve the exact same problem at the exact same time. Well, we see pictures of, uh, uh, you know, off the coast of California, the Long Beach port, right. and the Los Angeles port, and ships are backed up, and we're told that, you know, if you go over the horizon, they're still backed up. And into the mist, they're still backed up. There's hundreds of these <laughs> yeah. ships out there. What's the problem there? Why can't they, why can't they get in and unload on a timely basis? So part of this actually predated COVID-19. Uh, we have had labor shortages in trucking, for instance. This is an incredibly difficult job. It's an incredibly lonely job. And it's a pretty underpaid job. And so they've had a difficulty in attracting workers for a long time. And this predates COVID. And so now with the shakeup that was COVID, you have folks who are considering other career options. Maybe they want to stay with driving, but they'd like to stay and live in the same city as their family. And so this exacerbated an existing problem. Now to the port specifically, I know one thing that they had to do was increase the amount of hours that they were open. Mm -hmm. That was a good idea. I'm not sure why we didn't do that earlier. Uh, some of it does have to do with bringing labor back into, into this industry, which has been tough for them. Uh, but I, those are some of the changes you're seeing made. Uh, the Biden administration has also put together, you know, they're, they're getting folks like Home Depot and Walmart, who are typically competitors, to work in concert and work with one another, kind of play the conductor role of, hey, let's all try and move this ball forward. I was visiting a Dell computer plant one time 
and uh, they were describing their just-in-time inventory. And so yeah. literally the truck comes in, the part comes off the truck, and it's on the assembly line. I mean, it's just magical about how efficient that system was. But then you, you throw in just-in-time inventory, if the truck's late, then the whole thing backs up. And there, you know, there's no inventory supply to, to continue the manufacturing. And that's, that's part of the problem. Some of these efficiencies were great when everything was working really, really well, but throw a hiccup into the issue, and all of a sudden we see all these problems that maybe we hadn't identified earlier. Yeah, and we also have an on-demand lifestyle. You know, if I purchase something on Amazon, I'm pretty sure that it will be there the next day. And companies have tried to move closer to that. You have other competitors of Amazon moving to that model as well. So you have just-in-time shipping along with on-demand <laughs> receiving. And we just have to be spot-on right to get these mm -hmm. two in concert with one another. Uh, it a little bit reminds me of how like a, a coal electricity power plant will work. They take a long time to ramp up their production to be able to produce a steady flow of electricity. The, the, an, uh, the analog is a car on the highway. It might take you a little bit to speed up, but then you can stay at 60 mile per hour pretty easily. That's what's happening right now in our churn and as we're going up into the supply chain and trying to get things back together. Mick, talking about how the supply chain has got to work together, such as in the Dell example, made me think of, of, I think about these things, don't ask me why, of the old I Love Lucy episode <laughs> where she was on the supply line yeah. of... The chocolates. The chocolates, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> it, something started to happen, and all of a sudden, <laughs> everything fell apart because they couldn't stop the line. I laugh at that still. But uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's some of what you're talking about, the, mm -hmm. that the efficiencies all have to work together. It's not enough to be efficient at one end if you aren't mm -hmm. at the other. Uh, um, my wife Amanda, who's a producer on this show as well as uh, doing a lot of other wonderful things, uh, told me yesterday that uh, she saw an article where 80,000 truck drivers are needed in the United States right now, and they can't they can't find them. They're having a heck of a hard time training, finding and training 80,000 truck drivers. How did we get in a situation where we're in such a need? what seems to be overnight. I mean, I'm sure it's not overnight. It's not overnight, and that's an industry that's been very tough on their workers. They've transitioned a lot of the costs of participating in that industry onto the individual producer. So if you see a truck on the highway, probably the person driving it owns that truck, which meant they had to buy and finance that truck. Uh, and, and they're also responsible for the gasoline that goes into that instead of, you know, for instance, the company that they work for. And, and that's, put, that, that's made the quality of that job really go down, which is you're going to have a hard time attracting people to an already tough job when you're also imposing new costs on them. Dr. Travis Roach is the department chair at the uh, School of Economics at the University of Central Oklahoma. We'll be right back. One more segment with Dr. Roach. One of the best kept secrets about the Post 9-11 GI Bill benefit is that it can be used at a trade school or a technical school, and it doesn't have to be used at a university or college. These are benefits that the veterans have earned through their service, and they should take advantage of it. Veterans really need to understand that there are many resources offered by the Oklahoma Department of Veteran Affairs. They are there to help you find the right school for you, the school that will help you and your family make great steps into your future. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Dr. Travis Roach is our guest. He's the chair of the economics department at UCO. Kent? Uh, Travis, uh, when uh, we were thinking about this, I think you mentioned that uh, inflation was 
uh, at least some part of the problem here. What's going on with inflation in the country, and is it exacerbated by this supply chain uh, hiccup? So that's a really good question, um, and because it, we, we hear it in the news every single day. I don't think I've gone on a car ride to campus without hearing the word inflation. And I sometimes wish we had a better word for this type of phenomenon. So when I'm teaching my students, you know, we draw a lot of supply and demand graphs. It is an economics class after all. I have to put them to sleep a little bit. But if you imagine, this is exactly what we're talking about in those classes every single day. You move a supply curve, you move a demand curve, and we go from one equilibrium price to a new equilibrium price. And what's fascinating about right now is that this is that time in between. This is how we get from one price to another. So the question connecting this with inflation is, is this a long-run phenomenon? Is this maybe just temporary? So there's an old quote that the best cure to high prices is high prices. So prices are actually a signal. It's like taking uh, the, the temperature reading of a patient that's sick. It tells you some information. It tells us that goods are in a little bit more scarce supply than they once were, and the price has increased as a result. And that, that, that serves as two functions. So on the one hand, suppliers will have a better incentive to enter into the market and to bring more, extend more effort into providing this product. And on the other hand, it reduces consumption by consumer. So if I'm sitting there considering that 11th present to put underneath the Christmas tree, maybe I, I pull back my demand just a little bit. And that helps clear the market. So prices, th this is a healthy sign of our price system and of the market economy working. That doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. That doesn't mean we don't feel a cute sense of, you know, say, if, if I'm used to buying a steak at the, the counter in, a, in the grocery store, I might have to change my consumption a little bit. Um, but the, this is prices working as they're intended to. I would expect that we should see competition bring these prices back down. So my, my thought on this is that this is a short-run temporary phenomenon that it's not something that will happen and last on into the future. Inflation really occurs when there's too much money supplied in an economy, and I don't think that that's what's causing a devaluing of a dollar by any means. I think these are short-run price signals. Well, I also wonder if the labor shortage won't just increase the amount of robotics that goes into to certain industries. For instance, if you're McDonald's and you're having trouble hiring people, and the people that are making decisions about that, they, they can take out a, a chain or two or a link or two in the process of uh, at the uh, you know at the at the end uh, store, um, then I, th I think you may see you know positions eliminated. Isn't that likely? If if the cost continues to go up, at some point it makes economic sense to replace workers with some other uh, means. That's right. Uh, you know we would call that an efficiency. Um, I hesitate to say that because in some cases, if you cannot make a product or if you can't. If your company cannot be profitable without these workers, then they're still necessary. And so to the extent that their wages can raise up because they provide value to this industry, yeah, I think that's a good thing for the company who still gets to continue to produce and, uh, and be in the market. It's also a good per thing for the person who's employed. But you're right, there's, there's absolutely going to be this kind of capital labor trade-off the more that we might see wages increase as a result of that shortage. Yeah, so we could see short-term. Um, wages go up, sure. but longer term, businesses might invest in AI or in robotics and start to look back and create an efficiency that could ultimately slow the rate of inflation or, I mean, possibly even lower their costs. Yeah, that's possible, but then we also have folks who maybe used to have a job or were in a place mm -hmm. where they would, and they no longer do. And I, I think that's a problem that we'll be facing for a long time. This is a question we've been talking about mm -hmm. since the Luddites. Anytime a new technology comes along, right. we're concerned about yeah, it. Yeah, it's certainly not um, new. Right. It's, but, it, but I guess we, we sense it's increasing. I mean, sure. the, the rate is increasing because of technology. But yeah. it's been going on ever, you know, ever since the first farm machinery showed up in rural areas and started replacing farm workers. That's exactly right. And, it, you know, it, it's always difficult to be in what feels like a very transitionary period. And back mm -hmm. to truck drivers, I can understand someone choosing not to enter that industry when there's been talk about automation of trucks first before cars. And so if we have autonomous trucks shipping goods across the country, I may not want to make that investment into purchasing my own truck and joining this industry. I think of a phrase that I can't attribute to anybody in particular because I don't remember. But uh, I think most of the public is concerned about the short-term effect because that's what's hurting them or helping them right now. 
to talk about the long term uh, is not necessarily meaningful while it does exist, it, while it is not irrelevant. Uh, in the long run, we're all dead. Uh, I've forgotten <laughs> what economists said that. but uh, <laughs> might any, <have> Friedman. <laughs> sounds like Friedman, doesn't it? any event, <clears throat> uh, uh, certainly probably our viewers are more worried about the, about the short-term effect. And, and are we looking at this uh, supply chain hiccup to be solved within reasonably within six months, within a year, within five years? What do you think? I tell you, you know, the, the joke among forecasters is to give a date or a number, but never both, and then you'll always be right. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to think, you know, there's just been so much uncertainty injected into the system, and it's because COVID still exists. It's because, you know, we, we're hopefully on the back end of a Delta wave, but I, I know the Greek alphabet, it goes a lot higher than Delta. And with low vaccination rates, that, that holds back business. This is too much uncertainty. If you're someone who cares for somebody who is highly at risk, if you have children, you may not be willing to go and find that job you might have used to have had. And that's always gonna be a break on this system. So to the extent that COVID still exists and is circulating about our economy, it is going to put the brakes on any recovery we can have. Our unemployment rates are low right now, but the employment to population ratio is still very low. So we still have underemployment in that case. And in some cases, this is people that are not able to re-enter the labor force. As far as how long will this last, how long do we expect prices to be where they are? It probably depends on the good mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Used cars have been expensive for a while and they continue to be expensive and they'll probably be expensive mm -hmm. until the chip shortage gets figured out. And I don't know a number to that, but I would expect it's gonna take a little bit of time. Yeah, you drive by, uh auto dealers lots now, and uh, and you just don't see any cars. Some of them are almost empty or some are completely empty. Uh, the, I guess that's all sitting on those container ships out uh, in the ocean. Right, and you know, this is a problem that hits me personally. My car just rolled over 300,000 miles. And so I'm kind of keeping an eye on it. You know, I'd like to maybe purchase a new to me, but a used car, but I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna, maybe I'll end up at 400,000 miles. I don't know. But I, I, I'm waiting and watching this market to cool off mm -hmm. a little bit. Speaking of, in, of industries and transition, you've done a lot of work in the area of energy economics. What, do you, what are your predictions uh, involving Oklahoma's economy, the, the oil and gas industry in general, as uh, we transition to different fuel sources? Yeah, um, so in the very short run, so what we've seen is the price of oil just went above 80 the other day. Uh, I can remember back to last summer when it was literally negative because of how futures work. And so yeah. rig counts are still about 20 to 30 percent below what they were pre-pandemic. And that's part of this. It takes a lot of gears to start moving to just get a new rig out where it used to be producing. But these high prices do signal that there's profit to be made. So that should bring on more production. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about how Oklahoma is positioned specifically just with the vast array of resources we have. We are in the wind column. This is a windy area. It's also a very sunny area, and we are also close to some of the major demand centers in the United States. So to the extent that the transmission network can get rebuilt and upgraded, we stand in a place to be able to be net providers of electricity to half of the United States. That's a good thing for our state. Travis Roach is his name. He's the Department Chair of Economics at UCO. Thanks so much for coming on The Verdict. Thanks. Really do appreciate it. And congratulations again on your promotion. Thanks. You've given us a lot to think about. Kent and I will be back right after this. It used to be okay in teacher's lounges. It used to be okay in maternity wards. It was okay in sporting arenas, college campuses, and office spaces. But now that we understand the deadly dangers of secondhand smoke, that's not okay anymore. So why is it okay that thousands of employees are exposed to it every day at work? Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's protect hardworking Oklahomans. Join the fight at stopswithme.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, 
Each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I think for us, once we got started and we began to see the tremendous need um, just within our state, um, it really was just a calling for us. The blessings far outweigh any obstacles that we've faced. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Well, that's a good show. Uh, Dr. Travis Roach, uh, economics chair at UCO, and to talk about supply chains. Well, congratulations to UCO uh, in promoting that uh, young man, and I'm sure he will uh, do great service as the chair of the economics department. He uh, was preceded by Dr. Jeremy Aller, who's now dean of the business school. And uh, both those young economists are really making a name for themselves and are wonderful resources for us and, and for the public generally. He gave us a lot to think about. I thought one of the themes was that the effects of COVID and its impact on the world's economy are not on the way out anytime yeah. soon. I mean, yeah. that, that's part of what we're dealing with here. It just takes a long, long time for all those things to be worked out and to get back to what we thought was normal. Yeah, it, it comes in a lot more quickly than it goes out, yeah. and we're still dealing with it. We have some website information. You can get more information about <clears throat> Travis and uh, his department at uco.edu. That's uco.edu. And we have a website. Love for you to log on and tell us about a guest you'd like to see or a subject you'd like to see us discuss on a future show. Our website is theverdict.tv. That's theverdict.tv. We'll see you next week.